So we're continuing our Heroes series this morning. And, uh, and we're looking at Genesis chapters 12 through 25. We're looking at the, the life of this guy named Abraham. And before we dive into there, who is the person that it most inspired your faith? Who is that faith hero in your life that influenced you and encouraged you to follow Jesus? Now, I'm looking for an answer right away because some of you need to ponder that. You may need to think about that. Uh, but here's what I want you to do. Uh, I want you to think about who is that faith hero in your life. And, uh, and over lunch today, or when you get together with your life group uh, at some point, you guys take a moment and just kind of share who your faith heroes are. Just kind of encourage one another by telling those stories of how people impacted your life because they were obedient to God and spoke into your life as a faith hero. Now, most of us in this room have somebody that we would say, hey, that's my hero of faith. That's that person who influenced me. And most of us in this room, at the same time, would feel like we are not faith heroes. You know, we, we would probably like to be faith heroes, but, but, and by the way, I believe every single person in this room can be a hero of faith. I, I believe that God's calling you to be a hero of faith, and, and so I, I want you to put that on your agenda, but, but most of us really don't see ourselves in that light. But uh, here's, let me put it this way. How many of you would like to be more faithful, full of faith. How many would you like to be more faithful? Okay, lots of hands go up. Anybody want to be faithless? <laughs> oh, see, nobody at any of the services has said they wanted to be faithless. See, we want to be faith heroes, and today we're looking at a true hero of faith. Uh, a guy named Abraham, we know that he's a hero of faith because the Bible points to him as an example of a man of faith. And we're talking about this guy called Abraham. Now, you may not know much about Abraham, so let me just give you uh, uh, just a little bit of background about why he's so significant. First of all, Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation, literally. He fathered everybody who uh, is, uh, has that uh, ethnicity, that background. If you have any part uh, of you that is ethnic uh, Jewish, then Abraham is part of your direct line of descendants. See, he was the guy that God chose and said, I'm going to make a nation out of you, and through that nation, I'm going to bring the Messiah, and I'm going to bless all the nations of the, of the world. And, and Abraham is that guy that his grandson, Jacob, fathered the 12 guys that became the 12 tribes of Israel. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, and that's where we get the whole name for the nation. So Abraham is that guy. He literally is the father of the nation of Israel. And then secondly, Abraham is the father of faith. The Apostle Paul uses Abraham as an example and said, hey, look, he believed God, and he's the father of faith. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, kind of personal, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made that commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you are a spiritual child of Abraham. He's the example that we were pointed to and said, hey, this is the guy you need to learn from. And, and so that kind of makes Abraham a big deal, biblically. He's an, a hugely important figure, and he is a hero of faith. So today, I want to walk through Abraham's life, found in Genesis 12 through 25. And I want us to see Abraham's heroic faith. Abraham's heroic faith. And I'm going to move quickly, but uh, I want to encourage you, sometime this week, read the entire story of Abraham. It's like 13 chapters, you can read a couple chapters a day, you'll finish it in a week if you want to do it that way. My guess is it'll, it'll get kind of intriguing after the sermon today. Hopefully you'll want to go back and see some of the details that I'm going to allude to or refer to in the story. So uh, Abraham's heroic faith, what made him that hero of faith that the Apostle Paul pointed to him and said he's the father of faith? Well, first of all, there's the call to move. Chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, now the Lord said to Abram, pause right there. Because some of you are going, uh, Pastor Chad, you mispronounced his name. You said Abraham, and I see Abram. Yep. He was called Abram, which means the exalted father. And in chapter 17, if you read it, you'll find that God changed his name to Abraham, father of multitudes. Okay? So that's why we call him Abraham, because that's the name he ended up with. So the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Reference to the Messiah coming through the Jewish nation, Jesus, uh, touching and blessing all the nations of the earth. Verse 4, so Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, that was his nephew. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. 75 years old, and God says, Abraham, I want you to get up, I want you to move, I want you to go to these places that I'm going to show you. Don't you love that? I mean, most of us, if a friend said to us, hey, uh, I want to take you someplace tomorrow, just get ready, we would want to know details, wouldn't we? Where are we going to go? What do I need to wear? What, what's it going to be like? What are we going to be doing? We're going to ask all these questions because we want to know. Even though they're a trusted friend, even if it's a family member, we'd be prying them for information. You know, we'd want the destination so we can log into Google Maps and see where it's going to be. We're going to check out all these different things. And God just says, Abraham, I want you to pack up and I want you to move. Not just visit. I want you to move your family. And when you get to the place I want you to be, I'll tell you. I'll tell you when you get there. And see, here's the thing. We want details. God wants followers. People who will trust him. And Abraham trusted God, and he acted in faith, and he moved where God told him. By the way, did you notice this? God says, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless the whole world through your descendants. And Abraham is 75 and childless. His wife Sarah is 65, and they don't have any kids. So Abraham said, all right, God, I'm going to believe you, and he got up and moved. So first of all, we see Abraham's heroic faith in the call to move. And then we see Abraham's heroic faith in his belief in God's promise. His belief in God's promise. Turn over a page if you have a Bible like mine. Chapter 15, verse 6 is what we're going to look at. There's a conversation between God and Abraham. They talked a lot. And God, again, is saying to to Abraham, I'm going to bless all the nations through you. And Abraham says, how are you going to do that? I don't have any kids. That, you know, the, the person who stands to inherit all my stuff is uh, like a nephew that lives in, in Syria. Uh, so I don't, I don't get this. And God says to him, I'm going to bless you with a son through Sarah. And verse 6 says, and Abraham believed the Lord and God counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God at his word. And God counted that as righteousness. That's why he's father of faith, because he trusted in God's promise. And then the the next heroic act of faith, really the the, the big one, the one he's most famous for, is found in chapter 22. I encourage you to flip over a few chapters. A lot's happened between 15 and 22. Uh, Abraham and Sarah actually had a son. His name was Isaac. And, uh, and it was in his old age, and it was a child of promise, and he was all excited. And then we see the willingness to sacrifice on Abraham's part. The willingness to sacrifice. Chapter 22, verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Skip over to verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And again, he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Now, those of you that grew up in church, you know, you grew up going to Sunday school and vacation Bible school and stuff like that. You're like thinking, that's right, Abraham, great man of faith. He was going to sacrifice his son, and he didn't. Those of you that have never heard this story before are going, this guy is the worst parent ever. He ought to be arrested. He's a psycho. I can't believe he's going to do this. He's going to kill his own son. What are you thinking? Doesn't he know this is wrong? No. This is like between 1800, 1600 B.C. There is no law prohibiting child sacrifice. God gave that to his people, Deuteronomy 18. He forbids sacrificing children to the gods or to him. 
The people that were around Abraham routinely sacrificed humans, including their children, to their gods. In other words, it was standard cultural practice. Now, Abraham wasn't sacrificing his kids, and, and when he heard from God and, and he spoke with God, he had a direct relationship with God, but he didn't have the Bible that we have, and God said, I want you to take your son and sacrifice him. Abraham didn't want to do it because he loved his son, but he trusted God, and so he was being obedient to God, even though he didn't want to be obedient to God. And so there he went to the place, built the altar, put his son on it, took the knife, hating himself every step of the way, but he trusted God, and God stopped him and provided another sacrifice. Now I want you to think about this. God tested Abraham by asking him to do something that God himself was willing to do for us. Because God sacrificed his one and only son, Jesus, on the cross for your sins and my sins so that we could have life eternal. And here's the thing, Abraham trusted God. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that Abraham trusted God because he believed that even if he killed Isaac, God could raise him from the dead. Now that's faith. That's amazing faith. That's heroic faith. That's why he's the father of a nation. That's why he's the father of faith. And I don't know about you, but I would love to have that kind of faith. But when I look at my life, I see my faithlessness. I see my failures. I see my, my doubts. I, I see how many times my pride and my greed and my fear and my lust and my laziness and my envy have overwhelmed my faith. And there's no way I could ever be a hero of faith like Abraham. Maybe you feel that way too. You look at this hero of faith and go, wow, I, I just, I don't know that I'm there. And friends, that's why we read the Bible. Because that's not the whole story. I want you to know that even the faithful can be faithless. If you read the story of Abraham, you're going to see this. So I'm going to point them out anyway. Uh, you see, Abraham, our faith hero, the father of our faith, had some flaws. And they're captured in Scripture along with his great heroic acts of faith. So let me just share some of these flaws with you. First of all, Abraham had um, a lying problem. Okay? Just a lying problem. Genesis 12 and 20 tell the story. Uh, and, and basically the story is this. Abraham was a weasel. Okay? He moved into these countries, these areas... Egypt was one of them. Later on, it was uh, up in the, the promised land with this guy named Abimelech. And, and, and he lied about his relationship with Sarah, his wife. Now, here's the deal. I, I, I can't imagine this, but, you know, uh, Sarah, when they left Haran and, and journeyed to the land that God would show them, was 65 years old. But she was apparently incredibly hot. Okay? I, I mean, she was just must have been smoking hot because everywhere they went, Abraham said, Sarah... These people are going to want you. The king of this country is going to want you. And he's going to kill me to get to you. And so let's just tell everybody you're my sister. And now that's technically not lying. Abraham points out when you read the story because they were related. Okay, they were relatives. They were like half brother, half sister. And so they're family. And I know some of you are going, ooh, gross. That's okay. They're from Arkansas. And uh, <laughs> if you're from Arkansas, I repent. I'm from Kentucky. I've got no ground to stand on. So... Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but here's the deal, they, you know, and so, so he, he lied about their relationship to protect himself from people that he was afraid of instead of trusting God to protect him. Okay, he trusted God in these credible ways, but he didn't trust God to protect him from men who were powerful and around him. And so he convinced Sarah to, and, and the king of Egypt and the Sabimelech, they took Sarah to be one of their wives, and then God showed up as like, don't touch her or I will kill you. God protected Sarah's honor when Abraham should have. If he trusted God, he would have. So uh, Abraham had a lying problem, and then Abraham didn't trust God to provide an heir. Uh, see, God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son through your wife, Sarah. And, and Genesis 16 is the story of where they just basically were impatient. 
They, they didn't wait for God to do what God had told them he would do. And, and so, you know, they're getting older, and Sarah is like going, well, I guess I can't have kids, so, hey, Abraham, why don't you sleep with my servant girl? And Abraham's a pervert, like most guys, and he's like, okay, if you insist, honey. <laughs> and he fathers a child through his servant girl Hagar, and the child's name is Ishmael, and Ishmael grows up. And, and in fact, Abraham actually says, God, since I don't have a kid through Sarah, why don't you bless Ishmael and let him be a nation? And, and God says, like, I'm going to bless him, but he's not the one. I told you what I was going to do, and I'm going to do that, and, and you need to trust me. And because Abraham didn't trust God to provide an heir in time, in God's time, he, and he kind of rushed it, he created the first situation that uh, I you know, just could call you know, real housewives of the promised land, part one. Because Sarah got jealous of Hagar, and she threw her out and chased him away, and then God took care of him. And, and here's the deal. Because of his impatience, Abraham created a situation where the children of Ishmael and the children of Isaac were enemies for generations. Because the father of faith didn't trust God to provide him with an heir. And then the third thing, you know, faithfulest thing we see Abraham doing is he laughed at God's promise. He laughed at God's promise. Chapter 17, God reiterates his promise to Abraham, and Abraham's old by now, and, and God says, I'm going to give you a son uh, through Sarah, and, and Abraham is impatient again, and he mocks God. Here's what he says. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? I mean, come on, God. So the father of faith, who earlier had believed God and his promise, now questions God's promise a few years later. Okay, it was a couple decades later. But he questions it. Now, of course, the story goes that after he questioned it, uh, a year later he had a son through Sarah in his old age and her old age. It was a miracle because God's in the miracle business. And Abraham had heroic faith, except for when he didn't. Kind of like us. Sounds a lot like us, doesn't it? We want to be faithful. God, we trust you, we believe, but we, then we don't. So what is heroic faith? I mean, Abraham's our example, and, and he's our examples to give us hope to understand that, that we can be heroes of faith. We, we can step into this, but we have to understand what it is. So how should we be faithful, and, and why is Abraham celebrated? So I think heroic faith is attainable for everyone in this room who's a follower of Jesus Christ. I just want you to know that. I, I, don't, I don't think it's like some magical thing that only a few people can. I think every single person here can be a hero of faith, and I want you to, to hear how. Uh, it involves two elements. You want to have, have heroic faith, you need these two things. First one is belief. Belief. The Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 4, verse 3 says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Obviously, he's quoting Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and he counted it to him as righteousness. It, heroic faith begins with belief, which is why Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. Belief in Jesus, and he will forgive your sins. He, he will uh, guarantee you heaven. He will make you his own, adopted into his family. Belief in Jesus. That's why the Apostle Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. So it starts with belief. So do you believe in God? And, and, and if you believe in God, then you believe in Jesus, his one and only son, the Savior of the world. And if you believe in Jesus, do you believe in God's Word? The Bible. There's a reason we give these books away. Because here at Calvary, we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. It's our authority. So do you believe the Bible? It's God's Word. And if you believe the Bible, if you say you do, do you read it? Do you study it? Do you learn it? Do you memorize it? Does it affect how you think about life? Because here's the disconnect. So many of us say we believe. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus. We believe in scriptures. Except for when we don't. 
Because what we do is we read it and we agree with most of it and the stuff we don't agree with, we justify why we don't believe it. We do it at the point of marriage. All the time I hear people justifying the, their marriages, so justifying what they believe. And yet here, there's two elements uh, of marriage that make it biblical. These are two things that if you want to know God's will for your marriage, here it is. First of all, uh, it's got to be between, between a man and a woman. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Okay, that's biblical mandate number one. Biblical mandate number two, do not be unequally yoked. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to marry a follower of Jesus Christ. Why? Because then God says, if you both submit to me and you both love each other, as I've told you, then your marriage will work. You can make it work. And, and so those are, those are the requirements. And yet I cannot tell you how many people come to me and say, yes, but. Yes, but we're in love. Yes, but it'll work out. Yes, but, uh, and we justify why we don't have to listen to God. We believe, but we ignore. Or what about morality? I, I mean, Scripture is so clear. The Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says this. This is God's will for you, for us. Your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality. What is sexual immorality? It's any sexual acts that take place outside of that definition of biblical marriage. It's sin. It's, it's stepping into a place of destruction when God wants to take us to life. He says you were not called to impurity, but to live a holy life, a different life, a life that, that embraces God's standard because God wants to bless us, and yet we say, well, yeah, but it's what everybody's doing. Yeah, but I don't want to be alone. Yeah, but, and we, again, we just break down the, the scriptures that we say we believe, and we ignore them. And some of you are like, that's right, preacher, you let them have it. <laughs> okay. We do the same thing with money. See, the Bible says that everything we have, everything we own, everything we possess is a gift from God, and God actually is the owner of it, and we are not the possessors of it. We are the stewards of it. We're the ones who are caretakers for God. Do we live like that? Do we live like the money we have, the money we spend, the money we give belongs to God? Do we act generously towards God? Do we act generously towards others? You see, if we believe the Bible, then, then we'll actually submit to its wisdom rather than trying to live on our own. It doesn't stop there. The Bible says, don't judge one another. We know that people in churches never have any issue with judging people, right? Yeah, Jesus says, don't judge or you'll be judged. For the standard you use will be used on you. Think about that. The standard you use is going to be used on you. I'm going to be gracious towards people because I know when I get to judgment, I'm going to need grace. And yet, how often are we guilty of doing exactly what the world says and living as people who condemn rather than people who forgive? Or what about that? You know, one of the favorite church sins, you know, because a lot of churches I grew up in, man, preach against all those evil people out there. Don't mention about anything about the evil people in here. Do you know that slander and gossip are listed in all those same lists that condemn sexual immorality and witchcraft? Slander and gossip. They're like the twin sisters of church socials. Right? Because we just, we, you know, we destroy people with our words and, and, and we, you know, drag their reputations through the mud because we say that we believe, but we justify our sins. Belief means submitting your thoughts to the wisdom of God, allowing God to change your mind, your values, your convictions, and your philosophy. Are you letting him do that? If you want to be a hero of faith, you will. But heroic faith begins with belief, but it doesn't stop there. It's belief plus obedience. Obedience. Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Abraham didn't just say, God, I believe that you're able to raise Isaac from the dead, and so I'm not even going to bother going to that place you told me to go. He went there. He took Isaac. He put him on the altar. He was prepared to do the unthinkable. And God stopped him. He put action to his faith, to his belief. It was belief and obedience. Heroic faith <clears throat> is belief plus obedience. Hearing from God and doing what God says. Jesus put it a, a simpler way. He said, if you love me, you'll obey me. 
He didn't say, if you love me, you'll raise your hands and sing really loud and, and express things and emotional and post it on Facebook. He said, if you love me, you'll obey me. And many of us know what God tells us to do, and yet we choose not to act in obedience. We choose to be faithless. It looks like this. September 14th, 1860, a tightrope was stretched across Niagara Falls. 11,000 feet of rope uh, was used to span the quarter mile and, and to do the securing of the rope so that it actually had some stability to it. And a French tightrope artist named Charles Blondin told the world that he was going to walk across Niagara Falls. And so crowds gathered on both sides to see this idiot who's going to walk across Niagara Falls. And, and there he is with his little, you know, walking, you know, tightrope stick thing that they carry. Uh, and he walks across Niagara Falls, all the way across, all the way back. And the crowds go nuts on both sides. They're cheering him on. He puts on a blindfold, and he walks across and walks back, and the crowd's going crazy, and they're cheering him on. Uh, there's one account where he stopped in the middle, sat down on the rope, and drank champagne. He gets a wheelbarrow, fills it full of rocks, and pushes it across the tightrope, and the crowd goes nuts. And he gets to that side, and he dumps the rocks out, and he says, you guys believe that I could put a person in here and carry him across? And the crowd's cheering, yes, we believe you could do that. And he says, volunteers? <laughs> yeah, they didn't laugh. They went silent, man, dead silent. <laughs> not going to say a word, not going to raise their hand, not going to do that. You see, their belief stopped at the point of action. And that is so like us. How often does our faith stop at the point of obedience? See, most of us in this room, we believe. We believe in God. We believe that Jesus is his son. We believe he died on the cross for our sins. We've placed our faith in him. And today, God is inviting you to get in the wheelbarrow. Today, God is inviting you to sacrifice something that you dearly love. So are you going to be a hero of faith? Or are you going to be silent? Faithless. Now, for each of us, that wheelbarrow, it looks really different. For some of the men in this room, you know what that wheelbarrow is that God's asking you to get in? He's, he's asking you to stop complaining about your wife stop comparing your wife to other women you know repent of the pornography in your life and love your wife as christ loved the church but to do that it requires faith and action because you have to start treating her differently and thinking differently and believing that god will actually show up in your marriage and make it better for some of you moms in here of kids that are at home that wheelbarrow means that you have to care more about your child's relationship with Jesus Christ than you do about their academic or athletic or social standing. And reflect that on your calendar. See, for every one of us, God is calling us to, to lay that thing that we love more than him on the altar and, and trust him with it. And, it. and it means all different kinds of things to all different kinds of people in this room. But here's the thing. I believe that God is speaking to us. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I believe that God is speaking to your heart right now because the Holy Spirit lives in you and, and he's communicating what he wants you to do. And the question is, are you going to put that faith and that obedience together and unleash the power of God in your life to be a hero of faith? It may mean that you show up tomorrow night at Celebrate Recovery instead of talking about it. Because you've got a, an addiction, you've got a relationship that's codependent, you've got some kind of habit that owns you. You're so angry you spit nails and you need help and you know you need help and you've been thinking about it and you've been talking about it and God is setting people free through Celebrate Recovery and you haven't showed up yet. For some of you, it may be simply coming to a pastor or a counselor and saying, hey, I, I've got this sin in my life and I need help. I need accountability. I need someone who will cheer me on to, to get over this. For some of you, it may mean stepping into leadership roles because we need leaders around here. We need people who are going to serve and lead others to Christ. And, and, and God has been preparing you your whole life for that. You've done it before. And you're like, yeah, but I don't know if I want to do it again. For some of you, it's just simply 
Well, it's your money. And maybe obedience for you is writing a check. But see, for every single one of us, God wants our time, He wants our abilities, He wants our lives to be trusting Him in how we live. He wants us to be heroes of faith. Abraham's our example. I mean, he had great faith, but he was also faithless. We can do it if we believe and if we obey. But for every single one of us, the choice is ours. We're going to decide how we live, how we lead, how we serve, what we believe and how we obey. I believe that you can be a hero of faith. Let's pray.